Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler Collins. I'm a HPC analyst with uh, SharkNet out of Brock University. And uh, unsurprisingly, today we're going to be talking about Cython. And it's, you know, the title of the talk is Cython, uh, a first look. Uh, the end goal of this presentation isn't so much to explore every facet of Cython. It's actually more to convince you to use Cython. So to do that, we're going to kind of get everyone on the same page about some core concepts make some super broad generalizations that will make the computer science people cringe. And um, we'll hopefully get through a live demo together of a little bit of benchmarking on a test problem. Okay, so let's start with just a, a little bit of Python commentary. Um, it sure is awesome, but awesome's not free, okay? And a lot of other languages also uh, have this narrative. And uh, this is one from uh, Chandler Carruth in 2019 about C++. And that is, there are no zero cost abstractions. And it's an entire talk about um, hidden complexity and you know offloading something to another place doesn't just make the cost disappear. And so at the end of his talk, he kind of comes to the conclusion that each abstraction must provide more benefit than cost. And you know we definitely see that in Python. We know it's easier to write Python for the most part. Um, we definitely know um, that Python is very, very widespread. But you know, here's an interesting question. You know, we're all here from an HPC environment for the most part. What happens when you really, really need your Python to be faster? You wrote it in Python because that's what you know, and you're comfortable with that. But what do you do? And uh, you know, I have this joke here, which is presumably you just suffer, right? But you know, there are options. Okay, and so that kind of poses the question of what is Cython? We know that this is obviously going to be a solution to our problem here, but what is it? So Cython is a superset of Python and its entire goal is to recover the C-like performance we gave away. So there's gonna be a narrative here of we wanna go to C or C++ because it's faster, okay? And what Cython is gonna be doing is compiling uh, certain things from Python into C and C++ and call them as per usual from Python with little to no barrier. We wanna stay in Python because it's convenient, but we wanna take those bottlenecks and we wanna compile them to C and C++ kind of behind the scenes and then go on with our day or the rest of our uh, um, programming. And we're gonna do this with uh, annotations and uh, some C bindings and that's kind of what Cython is all about, okay? Cool. Uh, so here's, you know, kind of one of those last plugs for uh, Cython is here's two popular libraries that probably everyone's heard of that take advantage of uh, this sort of scheme and have some Cython in them. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get to that part uh, of the talk where we're going to get everybody on the same page. Okay. So we're just going to make some assumptions and talk about uh, some principles that you may be familiar with, depending on your background, or you may not. And those kind of three things are types and type systems, uh, what kind of compiled versus interpreted means in this sense, and why we want one versus the other, and lastly, uh, complexity. And kind of like I alluded to before, if you're a computer science major, uh, please don't cringe too much. Okay, I, I, I know these are some sweeping generalizations, but we're just going to get all on the same page. Okay, um, so the first thing we're going to talk about uh, for getting on the same page is types and type systems. So what is a type? You know, this is like one of those questions you have on an exam that's out of two and you're just supposed to give a definition, right? So in our sense, this is a known representation of data that has associated operations. So you have, you know, some representation for whole numbers and, you know, that's integers typically and we have operations for adding them, subtracting them, you know, dividing, multiplying, all sorts of things, okay? And in type systems that are dynamically typed, like Python, all of this sort of stuff and all of these interactions are typically verified at runtime on the fly, okay? And that's when you're seeing things like your runtime errors, where you tried to add an integer to a string and it's mad at you, or you, know, you reused a variable name somewhere and now it's not the type that you thought it was and weird things are happening, okay? Uh, there's runtime overhead in all of this. All of this stuff that allows you to write the code conveniently like that, there's almost kind of like this environment that is a safe way, um, safe environment watching over everything to make sure that things are going okay, right? And that has cost. Um, but 
it's really easy to write. We all write Python mostly because it's convenient. Okay, but this other system is the statically typed system. So variables and functions have signatures which define what types they operate on. So you have, uh, you know, an integer, um, I don't know, you have an integer x, right? That variable x is an integer and stays an integer and its interactions with the rest of the system will always be known. There's not some sort of hand waving that goes uh, on in the background to make sure its interactions are safe. It's actually just always an integer. And mixing and matching between types is not strictly allowed, you know, mostly, right? We can cast and, you know, we're familiar with these sorts of things, but typically these constructions, we write them in this one way and their known way, and that is their interaction. It's not, there's no need to protect against unwanted side effects, right? And so there's definitely advantages to this. You know, you have your syntax and your grammar checking at compile time, or even as you're, you're writing code that can catch errors and uh, provide kind of some analysis uh, on your code. Okay, and we definitely want to go to the statically typed environment because of all of this overhead, okay? It doesn't seem like much, but you'll be surprised. We'll get there. Okay, so compiled versus interpreted. This is another just really quick thing that we want to chat about. Uh, we've been told compile is faster, but, but why? Okay, so short answer, compiled code, you know, you have your static source that's running kind of on your machine, some sort of binary or a blob or something like that. And the real strength here is it can be highly, highly optimized for your local hardware. Those sorts of things exist, right? Python is something that you've kind of installed and it runs in its runtime environment or it's translated into bytecode or something like that. And it's not necessarily highly optimized for your hardware. But in compiled code, we could definitely do that. Okay. And again, this interpreter is something that's running, doing some layer of translating your code and then running it. All of this has to be done on the fly. And now we're starting to add up costs, right? Like even something like accessing variables in scope, like global variables versus some local variables, that's actually something that the interpreter has to manage and be aware of, right? Okay, and so our kind of last thing before we all get on the same page is complexity. So I'm not talking about big O notation and that kind of formal algorithmic analysis. We're not talking big O of N, but let's just think about actually what does list access look like in Python, right? Like we all can think back to stuff we've written with lists, but what is actually going on behind the scenes that's been abstracted away for us, right? Well, first of all, you know, there is actually interaction that Python is managing for you that's making sure the thing you're indexing into is a list and that you're indexing with is numeric, right? And okay, that doesn't seem so bad, but then, you know, there's all those other layers. Is it within bounds? If it's negative, is it actually do like, are we going to do that wraparound stuff where we can, you know, get the last element of with negative one. And then there's even more when it comes to just iterating through the list and lots of other stuff. Okay. So this is potentially uh, an unfair comparison, but what does array access look like in something like C and you know, your array is going to be your collection kind of data structure where you are putting stuff in here to process later or to, um, just store, okay? So the short version is read the memory based on some offset and that's it, mostly, okay? A lot like you are kind of locked into that pattern. There's no, if you go out of bounds, some languages should, you know, throw an error or some languages like C, they just let you read garbage memory and it's up to you to manage um, how that's handled, okay? But we want to use that second model because it's faster. Okay, and if we're writing code that we know that works, we can give back a lot of these things, okay? And that's exactly what, we, what we've come to now, which is we give back a lot of these abstractions uh, that Python has kind of set up for us. So we take our bottleneck functions and we compile them. Um, things that we know don't ever change, we should signal to Python and then thus the compiler that these will always be integers, for example, okay? Or this will always be a string and this interaction will always proceed like this. And that will make the compiled code much more efficient and it will 
like greatly increase your runtime, okay? Which we'll definitely see. Um, annotation of types, I just said that. And lastly, uh, complexity. So what's in a list? We briefly discussed that. Um, and shouldn't there be something better, right? There definitely should be an answer to this question. And the short answer is, of course, yes. There is something better. We can use things like vector from C++, or we can use memory views, or we can use NumPy or any of those things. And we'll briefly go over uh, vector in our live demo, okay? Uh, right, so our live demo. Uh, hopefully this all goes very smoothly, but here's just some quick details, okay? So the reference material, again, it's on the GitHub if you wanna follow along. Uh, we're going to be using Jupyter Lab. Um, this isn't so much a talk about Jupyter Lab as it is about Cython, right? So I'm not going to kind of get into the details of interactions like that. Uh, if you think it's cool, there's a thousand talks out there uh, on this topic. Um, you could definitely go uh, look at those, okay? And if we have time, we will uh, be exploring our uh, problem on Compute Canada systems. So actually, if you wanted to use Cython on Gram or Cedar or Beluga or any, any of the systems, Niagara, uh, how, would, how would you go about doing that? And it's actually just as easy as um, the Jupyter uh, methodology, okay? And so our test case is actually gonna be something um, that most people are gonna be fairly familiar with, and that is uh, a prime sieve, okay? So our canonical example is, uh, I'm gonna look at my reference here on how to pronounce this, Eratosthenes, or a sieve of Eratosthenes, okay? And uh, the algorithm kind of goes as follows. You create a list of integers two to n, you start at two, all factors of it are marked in the list as non-prime, maybe false or zero, whatever data structure you use. You go to the next true index, and then you mark all factors of that in the list as false. And then you go to step three, and then until some sort of termination criteria, okay? And so here is the super helpful illustration from Wikipedia that I've kind of borrowed and hopefully cited sufficiently, right? And you can see now all uh, sevens are being marked off and so on and so forth within uh, your table. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're going to uh, proceed to the uh, demo at, at this point. Uh, Jupyter Lab, we've got things like cells that allow us to run code and define code. Um, maybe you're not familiar with this. Um, there's also uh, little magic things you could do in Jupyter that will allow you to run cells in a particular way or access the terminal behind. And those are uh, magic commands. So if you wanna Google that, that's where that is. Uh, this allows you to rerun cells over and over. And kind of the most important thing for Cython is it really actually provides a super easy way to kind of profile your code and view exactly where the complications are at, okay? All right, so we're gonna move down to our typical sieve uh, algorithm. I'm not claiming that this is the best uh, sieve code of all time ever. I'm also not really um, claiming this is the most Pythonic, you know, or anything like that. Um, but this is our algorithm. We build our, we build our table, uh, we go up to the square root of n, we check if that's, a, um, if it's true at that point and then we uh, go through and we mark our um, factors. And lastly, we have our snappy list comprehension for which indexes uh, are true, and that'll give us our prime numbers. So I'll define the function like that. So now we have our function in our space, and I will uh, print out our primes. Okay, awesome. So we have our uh, prime numbers. We have a methodology for doing our prime numbers. Okay, and this is one of those, uh, our, our first kind of magic command that you may have seen before in Jupyter, but we have the ability to time things kind of fairly nicely here, okay? And so uh, we're seeing 125 milliseconds plus or minus one millisecond uh, for a certain subset of runs. And uh, I'll also run this very quickly on 10 million. All right, it's probably gonna take a little bit longer, <clears throat> but this is kind of our benchmark for what just this vanilla Python code, something that you might even write um, as part of your, maybe your thesis or your research, whatever, right? Some numerical method. Okay, but now let's kind of take our first steps into Cython. Okay, so in Jupyter, um, to load an extension, we can just use this syntax. We'll just run this cell. 
Okay, and then all of a sudden now we have Cython loaded. Now, I've marked this cell with another uh, magic command, and that is just percent percent Cython. Okay, that means that whatever I'm doing in this cell, whatever's defined, is actually being compiled to Cython. All right, so I'm going to run this cell and uh, show you what happens. And you know, the reason I've clapped there is this should surprise you a little bit, right? You didn't like where's the compiling? There's there's no, it's gone, right? Like this is amazing because it's all done in the background. And apparently this is just in C and C++ now, but we've just, we've just copy and pasted the function. All I've done is underscore magic, because I mean, it is magic, right? I've just copy and pasted the function. That's what that is. Okay, and now, now let's run it. Well, it's the same thing, you know, it's the same output. So this is, we've done stuff from C and C++ inside of this Jupyter Notebook, and we're actually not seeing anything different, but I, you know, it definitely is running the C and C++. It, it definitely is. Okay. So now let's, let's just really quickly time this. Maybe you don't believe me, right? And that's totally fair. I mean, that's what kind of good science is all about, right? And this isn't a giant sample size, right? There's no st super rigorous statistics here, but we're seeing 75 milliseconds over 125 on uh, a table size of 1 million. And I apologize, I'm scrolling around a little bit there. But that's an improvement just for marking this cell as percent percent Cython, right? Like that's a win as far as I'm concerned, right? Like that's gonna scale. I mean, it certainly has to. All right, so that's, that's our first win. We've, we've compiled it, it's all abstracted away for us and, and we have this. And maybe your question will be, well, how do I actually use that in other stuff? We'll, we'll get to that. We're moving kind of fast, so we'll definitely have time. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to grab this whole function, and I'm going to put it uh, over here. And I'm going to call this uh, sieve underscore uh, sci. Let me just reference my demo notes. Actually, I'm going to call it uh, working here just to keep consistent so I can copy paste uh, efficiently, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this. We know that that's working and it's faster magically, but now the coolest thing about interacting with these notebooks in Cython is this. If you add dash A here and you rerun the cell, what you get is an HTML output of what your code kind of is doing when it's compiled to the C and C++. And before you ask, even if you didn't use Jupyter Notebook, you can definitely get this HTML and you can still interact with it. It's just, I really like this environment because it allows you to do things like this. All I've done is I've clicked on this line and I see this big giant block of yellow. Like what is this, right? This is actually all of the C and C++ that's required to generate and interact with this sieve table line, just this list comprehension. Like this is massive, right? Like what, what am I even looking at? You might be asking. And like, I, I don't know, I know a little bit of C and C++, so I can definitely tell you it's C and C++ in here, but like, what is get size, get item? And like, okay, unlikely is a thing, you know, maybe that's helping out, you know, with some sort of branch prediction things, but this is, this is insane, right? And I, I'll definitely point out that the, the masters of Cython can definitely interpret this, but I'll, I'll show you that it's totally fine. You don't need to understand everything that's going on in here to make your code quicker, okay? And so maybe we'll just quickly look through this. We're, okay, there's, maybe this isn't great. Okay, yeah, even just interacting with setting things in a list are bad. This loop is bad. It's all, <laughs> It's all bad, right, is, is kind of what this is saying, is that there's all sorts of interactions that Python is kind of having to account for just to do things like for loops over maybe a dynamic structure, all right? And so one of the first things that Cython tells you to do is to mark types that you know are a thing and are going to be static as the type that they're going to be the entire time. Okay, and so if we look at our code here, there's a couple different things. Um, 
we know I, like I is used all over the place in here, right? It's, it's used fairly often. Every single time we use I, it's actually going back and checking the type every single time. And we're, we're using it a lot, right? Like that's, that's actually insane. So let's, let's just do cdef. And this is kind of the first new keyword you're seeing. cdef is the way to tell Cython and this compiling system that you're about to define um, some type. And maybe I'll do the whole syntax just to make it a little easier. cdef int i. So what you're saying is that i is always an integer. Any sort of thing that we're doing where we're compiling um, i, you could just assume it's an integer, it's gonna be okay, right? And we actually have another one in here. We have a uh, marker, that's also this. So we have this kind of convenient uh, syntax. And now what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll rerun this. Okay, well, that's interesting. We go back and we look at where we're at and we've actually greatly kind of reduced what this inner loop kind of was, right? Like it's definitely shorter. Okay, so maybe we could do a little bit more. And so an, another type hint that we could give it, it definitely uses sieve length fairly often. Why don't we signal that sieve length is always an integer? Okay, and so this is easy to do. This isn't even strictly uh, Cython. We can just give a type hint for that, okay? And we can go again. And we can see that you know, it's changed a little bit, but not much. We've maybe, maybe we've hit the wall with this methodology, right? Okay, and I'm, I'm gonna do uh, one more thing here. I'm actually also going to include um, this computation of uh, the square root, okay? And show you that it's actually totally fine to have your Pythonic kind of casting expressions done on these uh, cdef uh, variables, okay? So we have a value that we're taking the square root of, so it could be a double, we're casting it to int and we're adding one. Okay, and so, you know, you might say, Tyler, that's kind of unfair. You just came up with that out of nowhere. And it's like, yes, this is um, something I've experienced, but you should always take these known values, these known quantities, and signal exactly what type they are, okay? And with that, look, our, our, our outer for loop is now kind of this nice, safe uh, color at this point. Now it's not as bad. We can look at the C++ and it doesn't have all of those crazy interactions going on, right? Okay, so at this point, uh, you might be asking, let's run it, and absolutely. Okay, so let's run it on a million. 46 milliseconds. So I've picked a fairly small sample size here because, you know, I want to keep interacting with chat and I kind of chatting to you guys and, and whatnot, but this, this is definitely going to scale. The larger the table, the larger the, the algorithm. And sure, I've made the Python maybe a little bit uglier. But in the grand scheme of things, that again, we're, we're winning, right? Like actually we're getting faster uh, speeds and all we've done is mark a cell as magically Cython and be like, hey, these are integers, don't worry about it, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of go on to this next uh, test case. And you know, there's a bit of a spoiler for what we're gonna do after that as well. Okay, and uh, what I wanna do is I actually kind of wanna split up these into two separate functions, just to show that that's totally fine too. And additionally, this list comprehension, like what are we even looking at? right? Let's translate this to a regular for loop and kind of step out from that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to copy paste just in the interest of time, but it should, be, it should be fairly easy to follow exactly kind of what's going on here. Okay, so here's our first, um, our first function. It's exactly as it was before, but instead of the um, list comprehension that we return, we actually uh, are just returning the table. Okay, 
And next, we are going to have a function for, oop, that doesn't need to be there. We're going to have a function for appending everything to a list and uh, printing out the prime numbers, OK? So the new thing that you're seeing here is this cdef list. We're creating a new list, and we're going through it, and then we're returning the prime numbers. OK, so this is actually how you would uh, use Cython to uh, make a list in your, own, in your own kind of way, right? So let's have a look at this. Oh, I'll need to add the dash A to actually see our HTML output. And we can see that everything is mostly the same. Um, what's it complaining about here? OK, it seems to be nothing that we can kind of understand right now or that we're familiar with. And these function headers are still kind of confusing. But what's interesting is we still have problems just using this raw list. It's actually still not kind of translating properly and kind of perfectly to C because we don't really know what the type of the list is going to be. And we have to talk about the length of the list and these sorts of things. And we're still getting this pi object is true. So we're actually not there yet. But again, if we, uh, if we make a new cell here and I, uh, I time it, and this time I'm going to do a time it on the full cell. OK, let's, have an, let's take a look at what that looks like. 49. OK, let me just scroll up. It's, it's actually slower. So we've, we've lost out a little bit there, which is, which is no good. And you know, kind of to con continue the narrative, what I'm going to talk about uh, and kind of focus on is these list comprehensions and these list structures and this array access that we're constantly doing, that's a problem. OK, so that's what I'm going to try and tackle next. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to replace um, our, our lists with uh, C++ vectors, OK? And I'm going to show you how easy that is. So if you're not familiar with C++ vector, um, don't worry about it. Just treat it as a list that can only have one type in it, and it's super fast, OK? There's all sorts of stuff that goes on in vector that gives us awesome guarantees about the speed and interactions with it, all right? There's a reason we want to use vector, and it's fast, OK? So I'm just going to reload the extension Cython just for safety. I'm not entirely sure that's necessary, OK? And I'm going to run this cell. And maybe you should be amazed again, right? We're compiling in C++. This is how you signal that you're using C++. And we're just calling stuff from the standard library, totally fine. There's no weird abstractions we need to do. We're not doing any linking things. That's all you know, taken away for us, right? OK, so now let's look at actually this kind of toy function that I wrote, do stuff. Here's the syntax for a vector. We have cdef vector int totally a list. It's called totally a list because I think I'm funny, and that's a problem. But now, totally a list is a vector, and we have all of the vector functions that you could expect. And where those are from is you go to the website um, that defines all the interactions with vector, and you can see all those there. Okay, So that's how you would come up with what that function is. So if I just run the function, it works. The array access works. The, the adding to this totally not a list works almost exactly as we would expect. Right? This is, this, is ops, this is awesome. This is where we want to be. Right? So now, if we want to actually rewrite our code, and again, apologies, I'm copy pasting just for this demo, just to be safer, this is, this is what it's going to look like now. And I'll just add the dash A here. Um, we've got our libcpp vector importing. This is the syntax for it. And look. We've replaced, we've replaced the table, uh, that list comprehension, with a vector. We mark the indices the same way as I did before. Um, and over here, we have another uh, vector. And, and that's it. And, and it compiled just like that. And look, all of a sudden, 
those kind of problematic areas are, are slowly disappearing. It's not a big deal to index into the structure anymore because it's fast. It's not a big deal um, to just do um, like uh, an update on a value at an index, okay? It's no longer, it's no longer uh, slow, all right? And there is an interesting interaction over here that I actually only just noticed uh, recently. Um, this is returning sieve table, this function, right? We can see that. Oh. The length function, len, on table still works, okay? And that's kind of complicated exactly why that does that. But rest assured that if you start using vector, you're not going to be stranded in C++ land if you're not familiar with C++ at all. There's definitely things you can do uh, to get around that, okay? All right, so again, we're getting to that point where you're gonna probably ask me about um, what does the benchmark look like? And I'm gonna run a short one here, making sure my names are correct. Okay, and we're faster, all right? And the, the amount that we're faster by doesn't seem so much right now, but uh, as this kind of table uh, scales up, we're, we're significantly uh, faster. And if we remember, let's, let's just do this. Let's, let's make a new cell and let's do, let's do a table of 50, uh, 50 million. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna scroll up to the top and we're gonna see what that original vanilla Python was. Okay, it was 1.49 seconds for 10 million, okay. 1.49 for 10 million. Okay, and this is going to still run for a second. But, oh, they're perfect. 2.6 seconds on a problem size five times the size. That's awesome, right? We're winning. And like, in terms of what we've had to do to get there, it's not so bad. We've highly optimized one function by doing some type annotations. And we've uh, included a dynamic structure from C++. And that's about it, right? Uh, the last thing that we're going to get to here, and I'm just going to go through this a little bit quickly, is this inner for loop. And maybe you've noticed that in kind of the notes that I have here in the notebook. This for loop, it's a big problem, okay? And this is kind of when you start getting to maybe that expert uh, expert level of, of Cython and getting more familiar with things and maybe learning some C with it. Basically, what I've done is I've, I've converted it to a while loop because I kind of intuitively thought, all right, a while loop is probably easier um, for this um, compilation step to understand. And in that sense, I was correct. Okay, so this is all part of kind of maybe a skill set that you would be building about how to optimize certain patterns. Okay, so the marker is I times I, that's your initializer, here's your kind of conditional, do your stuff and increment. You know, it's if you've got your experience um, as a programmer, this shouldn't be uh, all that unfamiliar to you, correct? Okay, and the while loop is is now that inner loop is replaced by the while loop. We're not seeing our um, crazy kind of um, compilation step. Let's just do this quick benchmark on one million. Let's see, right? Fourteen point eight, pretty good in the grand scheme of things, right? If you got comfortable taking your numerical code and doing review on it like this, which you should be doing anyway when you're becoming you know, sure of your methodology, just adding some type annotations and maybe switching out your list structure to a vector is, is huge, right? Like that's something that could give you a, a, a big win. And, and lastly here, before we kind of finish off, this part of the demo, maybe I'll, oops. Uh, I'll do a really quick one on uh, our, our 50 million and, and pause here uh, just for a second to have another sip of water, just one second. All right, 1.33, I'm convinced. When I saw this, when I was doing this for myself, kind of learning this methodology. At this point, I was convinced. Five times the problem size and we're at the same timing. Okay, so 
as far as I'm concerned, this is awesome. Um, and this is something you should definitely consider using if you're doing HPC with Python and you need more speed, okay? Now, um, we do have time, so I'm gonna do this, but we don't have a whole lot. Uh, I'm on uh, the Gram system right now, and I'll just make sure this is lower down a little bit. Um, what you would do once you've kind of finished your interactions in your Jupyter Notebook to actually um, run this as a system is you grab that final function, the, the last one we made, and you put it into a PYX file. That's it, okay? And then what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be compiling this exact, uh, this exact function. So I'm gonna load the uh, SciPy stack um, because I know it has Cython. You can create virtual environments and do this yourself. And I'm gonna run the Cythonize command dash I, dash I makes it in place. So everything's nicely uh, output here in my folder. If you did dash A here, it would give you that nice yellow HTML kind of interface. So you could do it there. Okay, and we're seeing all the GCC that actually goes on in the background. This is exactly um, what we would be seeing. Okay, but we don't see it in Jupyter. We're seeing it now when we're doing this uh, inline compilation. Okay, so we're gonna open up our Python um, kind of interpreter here, and I'm just gonna do a quick import, and I'll show you why that works in just a second. And I'll just run that one function, and there you go. That's it. Copied it in, ran that one file, and now we have access it, we're able to access it from Python as a C++ function. So if I exit out of here and just do a quick LS, let's just do a few more so it's in the center of your screen. This is the C++ file that's generated. And the thing that we're actually importing is this shared object. That's what we're touching um, when we're doing that import C fast as SF. That's what that is, okay? Uh, last thing, this setup.py is kind of your equivalent of a make file. And if you wanted to do more advanced things like specifying the type of optimization or specific compiler flags, uh, that's where you would do something like that. All right, so like I've kind of said this entire time, uh, hopefully you're convinced. Um, and on this slide, I actually wanna do uh, provide a couple uh, of links to what I think are gonna be some common questions. Uh, the main documentation for Cython is there. That's how I got the stuff about CDEF and how to use those magic commands. That's where all that's from. Uh, Cython also uses a prime number um, uh, algorithm as its um, kind of hello world. So you could definitely start there. Um, probably a common question is, all right, I've got n by n arrays, Tyler, how would I do that? Uh, your answer is memory views. Uh, and you could use NumPy. You could create an array in NumPy and then you use a special syntax that will point to that and use the NumPy stuff as underlying infrastructure. Okay, and lastly, the Compute Canada Python documentation here. If you haven't run Python on our systems or you haven't done virtual environment stuff on our systems, please read that document. It's not exactly the same as it would be on your local machine. Okay, so please go there. All right, so uh, takeaways time. Uh, Python, super awesome, super convenient, but we give away speed to get there, right? We, we all know that. Cython lets us kind of claw back some of that speed and put us on a closer to even footing to the other, what we would consider fast languages, right? Um, there's awesome tools out there to help you profile your code with Cython, kind of like that dash A and the HTML stuff. And as we kind of saw there, compiling for use on Compute Canada systems is easy. So if you wanna make use of this in your own personal research and um, go about eliminating some bottlenecks, um, go for it, I really think you should. Okay, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody, for paying attention to me.